Okay, so now we're going to start talking about blood pressure. So we've got two lectures that are going to be on blood pressure specifically just to break it up a little bit. So here is what we're going to try and go through um, with the first set of lectures. Um, basic definitions, some equations, that sort of thing. So this is a, an equation that you should get used to using, okay? And so it's pressure, or excuse me, flow equals pressure divided by resistance. But if we use a little bit of algebra, we can rearrange that to say pressure equals flow times resistance um, or resistance equals pressure divided by flow. So I, I'm worried that I didn't say this first one right. So this is flow equals pressure divided by resistance. Now I want you to look at the units here. Um, flow is just a volume per time. So liters per minute is pretty common. Pressure gradient we measure usually in millimeters of mercury. The one that doesn't make sense is, or that's hard to kind of wrap your head around, is resistance, which is millimeters of mercury times minute divided by liters. Um, what does that mean? Not a whole lot, right? It's just not anything you can wrap your head around. Now, if I were to ask for an equation for resistance, do not give me millimeters of mercury times minutes divided by liters. That's that's the units. That's not an equation. Okay, so just want to be clear on that. So let's talk about this specifically with the cardiovascular system. So what is flow in the cardiovascular system? Well, it's cardiac output. Remember, it's the volume of something per time. And so in this case, it's the volume of blood leaving the heart per minute, usually liters per minute. Pressure is just mean arterial pressure. So it's the average pressure, again, average pressure in the systemic circulation. Remember, um, you know, typical blood pressure or what we say is standard 120 over 80. Well, we're going to talk about how you calculate mean arterial pressure to give us an idea of what's going on in the systemic circulation. Remember, systemic circulation, we're talking about between the um, uh, left ventricle back to the right atria. Um, and then the last thing is this total peripheral resistance. And so this is just how much resistance is out in the systemic, not pulmonary, but the systemic circulation. In other words, how difficult is it for blood to flow through? And we'll talk about this in just a minute. Now, flow and um, cardiac output and mean arterial pressure, we can actually directly measure, directly calculate. Resistance, total peripheral resistance, we can't do that. It's impossible just because of all the blood vessels and every tissue bed is different, that sort of thing. So we can only calculate that. So when it comes to resistance, here's an equation. Here's one equation that can you can use to calculate this, which is resistance equals eight times mu times L divided by pi R to the fourth. All right. So when you look at this, you don't even know what any, most of these variables mean. Really, there's actually only three variables. So we've got mu We've got 11, sorry, and then we've got R. Okay, and the answer is R, or radius, has the greatest effect because it's raised to the fourth power. All right, and so just to kind of give you an idea about this, let's just say that everything is 1. Okay, so 8 times 1 times 1 equals 8. We're going to divide that by pi times 1 to the fourth, which is 1, right? All right, now let's just say that we... Um, double the radius, right? And so we go 8 divided by, I don't know why this isn't working so well, but in this case, it'd still be pi, but 2 to the 4th is 16, okay? And so as a result, that 8 over pi now becomes 1 half, or 1 over 2 times pi. So if we double the, the radius, we actually reduce resistance by a factor of 16, okay? And so resistance is most most is greatly affected by radius way to think about this is milkshake right if you went to steak and shake this evening um which might be not smart since there's like a foot and a half of snow on the ground but if you went to steak and shake this evening and they said hey we're doing this weird thing or this promotion where we give you either a big fat straw or like one of those coffee straws that i don't understand what anybody does with them which one are you going to pick the answer is you're going to pick the fat straw so it's easier to get the shake now, in theory, you can get the same amount of shake through each of those straws. The problem is you have to generate a lot of pressure. Okay, or The joke that I use is you have to suck harder to get the same amount of shake with that, that coffee straw. Okay, And the same is true just of blood flow. 
like blood can get through a smaller radius, a vessel with smaller radius, but your heart is going to have to pump a lot harder. We don't want our heart to pump harder. We want it to be efficient. Okay. Now it's important to know that viscosity and length are also important factors. They just don't play as big of a role. They're not raised to the fourth power. So viscosity is just how thick is the fluid. Okay. So think about water and then think about something like maple syrup. Maple syrup is more viscous. It's thicker. And so if you're pumping one as opposed to the other, you're going to have to pump harder to pump something that's viscous. Okay. As a result, because or the reason is that you're creating a greater resistance the length of the vessel also plays a role right if you're going to pump something the greater the distance it has to travel the more pressure um, you're also going to have to create because you're going to have greater resistance now along with this resistance is controlled locally and then also systemically all right, so local control is what's going on in the specific tissue or vascular bed and whenever you hear the word vascular just think blood vessels Okay. When you exercise, think about what's going on with the oxygen needs of those different tissue beds. For example, if I go for a run, what what's going to be going on with the oxygen demand of my legs as opposed to my intestines? Okay, my legs are going to need a lot more blood, a lot more oxygen, so I want those to dilate. Whereas my intestines, I don't care if I reduce blood flow because when I'm running, I'm not digesting. As we talked about um, during week five, uh, blood pressure, like when we have an increase in blood pressure, well, this happens by having a sympathetic response. And so epinephrine is released everywhere and it causes vasoconstriction. Okay, so this is good for my, my, my intestines when I'm exercising, but it's not great for my legs when I'm exercising. And so the sympathetic is kind of like, hey, everywhere vasoconstrict. But then you have these local controls saying, actually, we're not going to because we need more oxygen. And so that local control is overriding the sympathetic reflex. And then also kind of playing into the sympathetic reflex are hormones. Um, most of the hormones we talk about that cause vaso or that affect vessel radius all cause vasoconstriction. These include epi, norepi, and aldosterone. Um, which we have not talked about, but we will with the hormonal unit will be the first place that we talk about that. So just a quick refresher about arteries. We've talked about this now, I think, in three different lectures. Arteries take blood away from the heart, generally oxygenated. Pulmonary arteries are the exception. They're elastic and have low compliance. So elastic and compliance are kind of the opposite. Now, when we think of elasticity, we think of something that's stretchy. That's not really the definition of elastic. Definition of something that's elastic means it wants to go back to its original shape. So using the water balloon or just a regular balloon, a balloon is elastic. Like we can inflate it. It's, hard, it's relatively difficult to inflate a balloon. But if we let go of the end of the balloon, it goes back to its original shape. Whereas something that's compliant, it's okay changing its shape. And so think about a paper bag. If I inflate a paper bag and let go of the end of the paper bag, it doesn't really change its shape. There's no recoil to it. And so arteries are elastic. They don't like being stretched out. And so we refer to these as pressure reservoirs. They help maintain blood pressure because of that elastic quality. And so this leads into the last thing that we're going to talk about on this video, which is systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Now, there's two things I want you to know about each of these pressures. I want you to know when they occur, and I want you to know what causes them. So with systolic blood pressure, it's easy. It occurs during the contraction of the left ventricle, and that's that contraction is also what's causing that pressure, right? So you've got um, a vessel, the aorta, which is about the size of your pinky. You've got a whole bunch of fluid, about half a soda can per contraction, coming out of your left ventricle going into a vessel that's the size of your pinky. So the aorta will expand to take on that extra blood, um, and that's systolic blood pressure. But then we've got diastolic blood pressure. This occurs when the ventricle relaxes, but the pressure has nothing to do with the heart. Let me repeat that. The pressure has nothing to do with the heart. The pressure has to do with that elastic nature, that elastic recoil. Okay, so it occurs when the, the ventricle relaxes, but it's because of the recoil properties or nature, or however you want to consider it, of the arteries. 
Okay, this question will be on the exam. It is undefeated. Okay, I've asked this every semester for five years, and I don't think I've ever had more than 35% of the class get it right. And I tell them every semester, this will be on the exam. Okay, so I will have a question that says, what causes diastolic blood pressure? And the answer is elastic recoil of the arteries. So the arteries expand to take on that blood, which is being caused by systolic blood pressure. But what helps maintain pressure and prevent it from dropping all the way to zero is that elastic recoil of the arteries. Okay, Think about a water balloon. You fill a water balloon up with water. You let go of the end of it. There's still pressure because of that elastic recoil of the balloon. Okay, and So here we've just got a picture to try and show that. So it expands to the increased volume, but then the pressure that's maintained is this elastic recoil. The aortic valve is closed, and so this elastic recoil causes flow to go this way. And that is the first part of uh, mean arterial pressure.